The SMP500 on a forward P basis looks to be very expensive as we can see red across the board which means anything higher than 30. Now that is why the focus of today's episode is going to be on 5 undervalued dividend stocks trading near their 52 week lows with a lot of upside. Now the first one we're getting into is Sanofi where we get a strong buy rating from Wall Street seeking Alpha give this a buy with Quant giving this a hold. As we said, near its 52-week low with a very attractive starting yield at 4.2% and a fairly low forward P of 11.1%. Now, over the last 12 months, it is up around 4%. Over the last 10 years, however, it has been very inconsistent and is up only 4%. In terms of looking at this company's performance, well over the next quarter they are anticipating high single digit growth to the EPS at 7.9 and when we look at the last four quarters, in fact they only missed one of them and that was the one furthest away, giving them a 75% track record. Now if you have faith in management's historical forecasting accuracy, well the EPS is anticipated to grow to 490 which in turn will lower the forward P to 9.89. We also like the fact this company has a 90 very safe dividend score. We'll run through these two models shortly but they both show severe undervaluation and nice to see an above inflationary increase at 5.6% in March this year. Now it was just reaffirmed last month that the dividend score is very safe and what that means for SNY, a dividend cut is highly unlikely. Now the key metrics, this is from the 07-09 Great Recession, they actually increased the dividend, they had above average growth, negative 3.3%, the S&P during that time negative 12, whilst also marginally outperforming the S&P negative 42% return, the S&P negative 55%. As we said, above inflation increased this year, although over the last five years, pretty much in line with the average US inflation rate over the last 40 years. But over the last 20, they have increased it around 7% year on year. And what's good to note is they are one year away from becoming a dividend aristocrat. So next year, very likely when they do increase that dividend, they will gain dividend aristocrat status. Now in terms of the first valuation model we're looking at today, and bear in mind we're not concluding on any of these models in isolation, we are going to run it through our own model towards the end. The blue tunnel representing the fair price, what we notice for the second time over the last year, this has come below the, the lower end of the blue tunnel indicating severe undervaluation and that is reinforced when we look at dividend yield theory. Remember that tells us a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five year average and again reinforced when we look at the forward P. 10.1 is below the five year rolling of 11.8 and on top of that it trades at a discount to the overall healthcare sector which looks to be at 15.9. In terms of the first metric we're gauging here today it is the free cash flow payout where we want below 60%. Remember we do typically tend to ignore the earnings on this channel. It is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting and the reason why we have these thresholds is to ensure management can continue to offer very attractive increases. Now 65% a little bit too high for our liking, nice to see over the next 12 months it is anticipated to come down to 57% but given they haven't historically done it, don't expect double digit increases from this company as long as we get above inflation with a nice starting yield that should be a fairly reasonable expectation. Free cash flow per share, ideally consistent increases over the long term. Whilst we don't get consistency, it has increased and nice to report 6.89 per share is anticipated over the next 12 months. Sales growth, 3 to 4%. Remember, 3 to 4 just at the bare minimum to keep up in line with inflation. Now, it has been a little bit inconsistent. 1% not looking great over the last full year. 6% on a trailing 12 month, telling us that 2024 should be a decent year for them and at least above that inflationary target. And when we do zoom out over the last 10 years, their top line has been increasing in the way that we do want to see around 50%. In terms of shares outstanding, we highlight this for your knowledge just to show whether or not companies return excess cash to investor pockets. We want to see share buybacks. Now, it is something they have done one or two times, but look, from 2018, it has remained unchanged, and therefore, we don't believe it is part of priority in terms of management and their capital allocation. Then we get to one of our favorite metrics, ROIC. 10% or more is what we want to see here. Give us faith, management are able to effectively allocate their capital 
and nice to see it does straddle around the 10% point over the longer term. Then we get to the operating margin. Two things we want to see. First one, above the minimum 12%. We do get that. Very positive. The second one is we want to see efficiencies, which means increases to their margin over time. Not something we get. 21% in 2014, 20 in 23. That is probably one issue that we would like to see them resolve moving forwards. And on the free cash flow margin, whilst again, fairly inconsistent in terms of the numbers, we can still see above that minimum 5% threshold. We then move on to the net debt to EBITDA, again another important metric as it does correlate to dividend safety balance sheet strength. EBITDA referring to the earnings before the interest tax depreciation amortization and the numbers that you can see below are the number of years it would take Sanofi to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. We want below three and that is what we get very consistently. Nice to see 0.84 in 2023, 1.34 expected over the next 12 months. So we can see balance sheet does look good. Dividend, as we saw, also looks very safe. Now let's jump into our valuation of this company. And as always, if you do enjoy the content, value is being provided, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified when these videos drop. Now our intrinsic value of $62. Now what we do on this channel is typically deep dives of companies where we run through each one of these models and explain the inputs and outputs. Today we're gonna get straight through it. We've got five stocks to cover. At $62, we always like to apply an MOS where we start off at 10% and buy companies at that rate if they meet our three golden criteria, wide moat, strong financial metrics, and good forward-looking data. Now, if you believe that in today's episode, it is a buy up to around $55.50, and then we keep going till it's near the current trading price. And what we can see, not at the 25% level just yet, but for Sanofi in the episode, 20 to 25% margin of safety, with Wall Street, as we saw, very, very bullish with the buy rating upside of 34% over the next year with their price target of $65. As always, give us your thoughts below whether or not you are looking to buy, hold, or perhaps sell any of these companies. We also want to let you know that we release a free weekly article every single Monday morning, so a new one coming tomorrow, where we talk about severely undervalued stocks in the market for your attention, as well as what's gone on in the market over the last few days. So click below, you can sign up and start reading straight away. You'll also be able to gain access to a spreadsheet running through 28 undervalued dividend stocks for the month of December. This has just been released a few hours ago, so do pick that up. We also look at the upside that Wall Street believe each one of these have over the next year. And on top of that, you can grab a newly released copy of 29 undervalued dividend stocks that Wall Street themselves believe have the most upside right now in the whole S&P 500. So click below, sign up, and you can start reading straight away. We then move on to the next stock, Applied Materials, where similarly trading towards its 52-week lows, a double buy rating, and quant with the hold again. In terms of the forward yield, well, lower than the previous company, 0.92%. In terms of the forward P, sitting around 18.31%. Not the worst performance over the last year in relation to the broader market, up 17%. Over the last 10 years, however, up nearly 600%, significantly outforming the S&P 500. We also notice green right across the board, so they are anticipating growth to the EPS every single quarter, with a 100% historical track record over the last four. Ultimately, EPS is expected to increase over the next full year accounts, there in turn lowering the forward P to 16.2. We get another very safe dividend score at 86 with an incredibly rapid increase to the dividend at 25% just in March this year. Well, in the last recession, they actually maintained the dividend. They had below average growth with a near S&P return at negative 57%. Dividend growth looking phenomenal, double digit every single year on average, 14 in fact over the last 10. And when we look at the number of years they have been increasing, it does sit at seven whilst they've been paying a dividend for the last 19 without a reduction. In terms of the valuation, well, when we zoom into over the last 12 months, we actually notice this has been trading at a severely overvalued element for the majority of the last 12. However, right now it does sit in reasonable territory. And when we take a look at dividend yield theory as well as the forward P, both of these essentially reinforcing that conclusion that on these models, reasonable valuation is essentially discussed. 
In terms of the information technology, it does sit at 25.9, there in turn meaning that applied materials right now is trading at a discount to the sector. Free cash flow, no issues. It is consistently below the 50% we want for the industry, and that's no surprise given how rapid they have been increasing those dividends. And for a company in a cyclical industry, it is very nice to see the massive growth it has had on the free cash flow. Although we do have to point out, again, in relation to cyclicality, over the next 12 months, it is anticipated to come down to 788. We then get to sales growth, where as we said, we want minimum three to four. They do hit that consistently, like we can see over the last two years, although around the 2% isn't something we want. Yet when we do zoom out and look at it over the longer term, we can perhaps give them a little bit of a leeway, given that over the last 10 years, they have increased their top line threefold. And on top of that, rapid, rapid share buybacks going from 1.23 billion 10 years ago, right now sitting at 834 million. Always great to see this when you do think about it in conjunction with that rapid dividend increase. ROIC, absolutely phenomenal, well above that minimum 12% we want to see, 31 on a trailing 12 month. Investors and potential investors will love to see that. We love this as well, not just above the minimum, something we didn't see with Sanofi, we get to see here with the increases to their margin, nice operating efficiency, and some very, very strong free cash flow margins. Then in terms of the net debt to EBITDA, 0.23, 0.24, 0 on a trailing 12 month, 0 over the next 12 months. It won't even take this company one day to pay off all of their debt, net of cash on hand. Now remember, our intrinsic value comes to $237. You can always grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below, running through your own numbers, whether it is for AMAT or any others that you do desire. Now our intrinsic value at $237, when we do run it through the MOS, at 10%, a buy at 213, at 20%, a buy at 189, and at 25%, pretty much where we see this company now, 25% MOS, 27% upside from Wall Street, their price target $222. And do give us your thoughts. Maybe some people do like this company, but actually prefer to have exposure to the wider market and may consider ETFs. However, others I do know want to pick individual stocks that they do believe will outperform and continue to outperform like we have seen from applied materials over the last 10 years. We then move into the REIT market with another double buy signal and a hold from Quant. Nice attractive yield, you could argue, sitting there at 4% with a P to FFO price to funds from operations at 17.81, trading at its 52-week low, down 14% over the last year. Over the last 10 years, however, it still has outperformed the S&P up 175%. Remember, if you do reinvest your dividends, this figure will be higher. We also like to see this pretty much green right across the board. And when we look at the last four quarters, at a bare minimum, they have been in line. So we still do like seeing that. And the funds from operation estimate telling us they do expect the increases to continue. And they're in turn lowering the forward P to FFO to 16.6. Another very safe score. We're on a roll three for three with another double severe undervaluation signal and another very attractive yield increase at 9.9%, something you won't typically find when you do look at REITs in terms of their increases over the last few years at least. Dividend safety was reaffirmed not too long ago. And when we look at the dividend growth, it isn't actually the first time they have increased the dividend at a very attractive rate. Just look at that 22% year on year over the last 10, we really do like seeing that with 10 years of consecutively increasing the dividend. In terms of looking at the valuation, well, when we do look at it on terms of the P to FFO, we can see over the last year, this company has consistently been trading at a severe undervaluation. And when we take a look at dividend yield theory and the P to FFO in terms of the historical performance, both of them, again, reinforcing this company does look to be severely undervalued. We do, however, note it does trade at a premium to the real estate sector at 17.2. But as always, some companies deserve to be trading at a premium. Likewise, some companies also deserve to be trading at a discount. Now, we don't look at free cash flow for REITs due to the fact it is a lot more volatile. We look at the adjusted FFO power in terms of the dividend safety. Below 90% is what we want. That is what we get consistently with 81% anticipated over the next 12 months. And similar to free cash flow, we want to see the AFFO increase consistently over the longer term, something we pretty much get for the majority of the period and expect it to continue that upwards trajectory journey to 206 over the next 12 months. Sales growth looking phenomenal. We want 5 to 10 at a bare minimum for REITs. 
double digit every single year and the growth of the A to FFO, which is very important for REITs, also looking very, very strong. We do quite like this in terms of having it in a REIT portfolio. In terms of the numericals, where well, we can see their growth has been exponential over the last 10 years. However, we do have to draw your attention to the fact that they have diluted your position as a shareholder over the last 10 years. But remember, this is very common in the industry. The reason why REITs do that, as we can see, they do retain little of that internally generated cash flow after paying out the majority as dividends. You just have to compare some REITs that will dilute your position at a much quicker rate than others. Royalty income, for example, are one of those. ROIC for REITs, we want three to 5%. We haven't got that consistently, but nice to see three in 2023 and on a trailing 12 month, which is the highest it has been over the last 10 years. And operating margin does look good with those efficiencies, 11 to 39% on a trailing 12 month basis. And net debt to EBITDA, we want below 5.5. That is the general rule for REITs. And we do get that over the more recent period. However, we can see over the next 12 months, it is expected to increase to 4.5, something just to keep an eye on, on a quarter by quarter basis. Our intrinsic value at $56, when we do look at it in terms of the MOS, at 10%, a buy up to $50, at 20%, up to $45. And in today's episode, we pretty much see this at a 25% MOS, with Wall Street, as we saw, buy rating very bullish. Their price target, $52 with 24% upside. We then move on to Eleven's Health with a double buy again and a hold again from Quant. Although we do know Wall Street's 4.45 isn't far off a 4.5, which would indicate a strong buy from them. Similarly to all the companies today trading near their 52-week low, a yield of 1.6%, a forward P of 12.3. Now it is down 12.5% over the last year, but it has outperformed the S&P even with the drop up 218%. Now over the next four quarters, only one of them they are expecting growth, and we can see quite a substantial miss in the more recent quarter, one of the reasons for the drop we did see not too long ago. Nonetheless, 75% track record, and they do expect the EPS overall to increase into December 2025, they're in turn marginally lowering the forward P to 11.53. Four for four in terms of dividend safety, very safe. We do like to see that. Again, another severe double undervaluation signal with a double digit increase at 10% in January this year. In terms of the last recession, well, no dividend was paid, no comparative data, negative 4%, so marginally above the average, but they also marginally trailed negative 61. Well, this episode seems to be very good for dividend growth investors, given the fact that a lot of these companies have been increasing those dividends at a double digit rate. ELV is no different with 12 years as well of consecutively increasing the dividend. In terms of this valuation model, well, over the last 12 months, for the first time in November, in fact, in the last year, we can see severe undervaluation. And again, that is reinforced in both dividend yield with the yield higher than the 1.22 and the forward PE sitting lower than the five year 13.9. We also notice it is trading at a discount to the overall healthcare sector. Free cash flow consistently below 60%, 21 in 2023, 22 over the next 12 months. So we would be surprised if we don't get another very attractive dividend increase. And the free cash flow has pretty much tripled over the last 10 years with a marginal increase anticipated over the next 12 months. Sales growth looking good. We do see a lot better than 3 to 7% pretty consistently year on year. And when we do take a look from a numerical perspective, we can see their top line has more than doubled. They've also done some share buybacks, maybe not as much as we would like to see, but again, a nice bonus on top of that double digit increase that we have seen on a very consistent basis. No issues with their ROIC, again, double digit every single year, 15 on a trailing 12 month. And whilst we don't like their operating margin due to the fact that it isn't above the 12%, when we do compare this, this is pretty much in line with the overall sector, so we can't really have too many complaints. And the same is to be said for the free cash flow margin. Net debt to EBITDA, we love to see this, zero right across the board, not even one day for them to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. Now, intrinsic value at $530, 
10% MOS, a buy at 477, at 20% a buy at 424, at 25%, not quite there yet. So right now for ELV, we do see between 20 to 25% with Wall Street, very, very bullish, near a strong buy rating, $535 price target, 31% upside, definitely one they believe you should consider in your portfolio. And as always, give us your thoughts below. We then move on to DO with only one buy rating from Seeking Alpha and a double hold from Quant as well as Wall Street. Forward yield, fairly attractive, 3.5%. Forward P, 17.5%. Now, it is down around 14% over the last year. Over the last 10 years, however, it is down nearly 3%. Bear in mind, this is if you had bought 10 years ago. If you had picked up at the drop, even at $109, you would be up only very marginally. In terms of their earnings per share, well, they do expect this to grow from 6.79, and that will in turn lower the forward P to 16.5. And look at that. We have 5 for 5 today, very safe dividend score throughout, and we also get another severe double undervaluation score with dividend growth sitting just above inflation at 5% over the last full year. In terms of the key metrics, well, they increased the dividend during the last recession, positive 5% sales, whilst also marginally outperforming negative 51. Over the last five years and the last 20 years, they have increased the dividend at high single digit. And when we take a look, they are now a dividend aristocrat with 25 plus years of increasing the dividend. When we take a look at the valuation metric here, again, similar to other companies today, over the last year, it has been trading at severe undervaluation and the gap is only widening even further. So could this be a great opportunity? We also see massive, massive severe undervaluation on both the yield as well as the forward P. When we do compare it, it is trading only marginally lower than consumer staples at 18.8. In terms of the free cash flow payout, below 70%, that is our metric for consumer staples. Now, it is fairly high in 2024, and over the next 12 months, it is expected to come down. That is a good sign, but again, something that we would say just to keep your eye on. Free cash flow, inconsistent, nonetheless, has been growing over the longer term, and growth is expected to continue over the next 12 months to 134. Now, we don't typically like to see negative growth to their top line, but unfortunately, we see that three of the last 10 years. And when we do zoom out, we can see their top line, whilst doubled, has been very, very inconsistent. Shares outstanding, they've done some share buybacks, as you can see, not as consistently, unfortunately, as we would like. But again, sometimes it's just not the priority of management and their capital allocation. No issues whatsoever on the ROIC. Nice to note, 16% on a trailing 12-month basis. And operating margin, whilst we don't note operating efficiencies, nonetheless, very, very consistently at a good level, 30% again on a trailing 12 month. No issues with the free cash flow above that 7%. And the net debt to EBITDA, probably something we would say keep an eye on, 3.3 on a trailing 12 month. It is near enough the fall that we would say on a quarter by quarter basis, just take a look. Then we get to the valuation at $143 at the 10% MOS. Well, a buy at 128 at 15% around 122 at 20. It isn't quite there yet. So for DO, we would say 15 to 20% MOS. Nice starting yield as we have seen from one or two other companies today. And the Wall Street forecasted price of $147 does indicate 24% upside. As always, give us your thoughts about these five stocks, whether you're buying, holding or selling. If you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Don't forget to sign up to the free weekly newsletter, grab those spreadsheets. Come and also join us in the Patreon where we do talk about our weekly buys and sells and we'll see you all on the next one.